I was wanting you guys to recite this psalm with me. So they're going to put it up on the screen. And then we'll, I just want us to go and recite it together to start off the night. So put up there. Yeah. So let's all say it together. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I always want to say amen. (laughs) But that surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Do you believe that? Do you believe it? I mean, do you really believe it? As I was studying through Psalm 23, I was just struck how we say this all the time. We recite this psalm all the time. It's a popular psalm to recite. And we say that, but I wonder, do we actually live like we believe that goodness and mercy of God is following us all the days of our life. The New Living Translation says this, surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. His love, his goodness will surely pursue us. God is pursuing us. The message interpretation says this, your beauty and love chase after me all the days of my life. God chases after us. His love chases us. It chases us every day of our life. So that means not just on the good days. That means not just on the days when we feel God's presence, not just on the spiritual days or when we feel like we're on cloud nine because God blessed us in some way. But that means on the bad days too. On the days when we're falling apart. On the days when we're struggling to find purpose, to find worth. When we feel alone and we feel exhausted. When we feel like, where are you, God? Surely, God's goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life, all the days. His goodness is chasing after us. It's pursuing us. So that brings us to this question. What is God's goodness? What is his goodness? Do we believe that he is good? God's goodness is something that we admire about God. It's something that attracts us to him. It's something praiseworthy. First Chronicles 16.34 says this, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. His goodness reflects his generosity. We see this in the common grace of God, right? Common grace is the blessings that you see poured out on all people. It doesn't matter if they're saved or not. We see it in everyday life. It's given to all of God's creation. He preserves and blesses everyone in different ways. And we see his goodness also in his special grace, which is the grace that he gives in salvation, the the grace that he gives to know him, to come into right relationship with him. But God is good to all people. He is good to all people through his common grace, and he is generous to everyone. J.I. Packer says in his book, Knowing God, which I'm going to refer to probably two or three times here because it's an amazing book if you haven't read it. Like, it's probably one of the best books that I've ever read. But he says this, 
When the biblical writers call God good, they are thinking in general of all those moral qualities which prompt his people to call him perfect, and in particular of the generosity that moves them to call him merciful and gracious and to speak of his love. God is good because he is perfect. He is good because he is perfect. He has no faults, no faults. He has no sin. In fact, it says he cannot even tolerate sin because he is just. Habakkuk 1.13 says this about God. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. His very nature is so perfect, so good, that sin has no place in his presence. It has no place. It must be atoned. Sin must be atoned, which means it, it must be paid for. And stop and think about this for a minute. How can we know God's goodness if we don't know his severity? Because God is stern. God will not compromise. He will not. God is a God of justice. He is a God of wrath. We only know his goodness because we know his wrath. And it's not very common to hear sermons preached on wrath, right? Like people, it's not popular. People don't like to talk about it. But people only want to think of God as like a gracious God, which he is. But he's so much more than that. He's so much more than that. He's not like us. He is not like man. He is perfect. He is holy. He is set apart. There's nothing impure about him. He is without blemish, without fault. He is perfect. 2 Samuel twenty two thirty one 31 says this, this God, his way is perfect. Matthew 5, 48 says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. It's hard for us humans to wrap our mind around this understanding of perfection because we're so far from it. So it's hard for us to get it. But that's why his wrath is loving, ladies. It's because he's perfect. It's because he is perfect. And how could he be good if he was unjust? How could he be good if he allowed sin without, to exist without some sort of payment? He couldn't be good. J.I. Packer wrote this, every display of divine goodness stands at a threat of severity and judgment if that goodness is scorned. If we do not let it draw us to God in gratitude and responsive love, we have only ourselves to blame when God turns against us. His severity, his judgment is real. And this makes his goodness all the more sweeter. But we have this problem because we're not perfect. And how can his goodness follow us all the days of our lives when we sin and we deserve wrath? Because God's anger is towards us. We are headed straight to eternal damnation. We are headed straight to divine judgment in hell for eternity because we're all born enslaved to sin. But Psalm 51, 5, it says this, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. But look how good our God is. Knowing that we aren't perfect, knowing that we sin, he sent Jesus. And Jesus was the propitiation for our sins. That means that the act of Jesus dying on the cross paid for our sins. His sacrifice abolishes God's anger towards us when we're saved. And it ensures of, of, of his fa favor. It ensures us of his goodness. This is so important to get, sisters, because this is the heart of the gospel, and it was the driving force in Jesus's life. I just want to take a few minutes to look at the importance this played in, in the life of Jesus, because in order to understand the goodness that will follow us all the days of our lives, we have to get this. 
This is the important thing. Look how laser focused Jesus was in his ministry. He was a driven man. He was driven. He healed people. He brought down false teaching. He cast out demons. He fed the hungry. He called disciples. He taught wisdom and mercy. He sent his disciples off. To, to, to evangelize for him. But listen, all the while, he was walking straight towards his death. He was walking straight towards his death. Jesus predicted his death at least three times that we know of. But he kept moving forward in his ministry. He kept going forward. There was nothing good ahead for Jesus. There was nothing good. He knew what was coming, yet he can continued to just walk in obedience, in obedience. Think about him riding in on the donkey to Jerusalem. Donkeys in biblical times that signified peace and humility, suffering and service. He comes riding in on a donkey while they're waving the palm leaves, laying them down on the ground. They're shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This was a triumphant entry. He rode in on a donkey, ladies, and he ended up on a cross. He ended up on a cross. He knew all along what his future was going to be. It doesn't appear good in the human mind. If we're just looking at circumstances, there was no goodness ahead for him. We see his betrayal in a man he trusted. I mean, how horrible. A friend, someone he did life with. Think about how you feel when someone who's close to you betrays you. You wanna run, you wanna throw in the towel, yet he continued on because his, he knew what his purpose was. He knew that the goodness that would follow us all the days of our lives depended on him. It depended on him and him following out the purpose of God. He was so driven that he was beaten, he was mocked, he was torn to pieces, but he pushed forward, tormented by the people until the end of him dying on a cross. Crucifixion is one of the cruelest forms of execution. The physical pain is unbearable, not to mention the humiliation. And not only physical pain, but think about his emotional and his spiritual pain. He lost everything good. Do you see this? He lost everything that was good everything, all so we could have goodness follow us all the days of our lives. He lost the presence and the enjoyment of God his Father, where goodness is found in the Father that was taken from him, our perfect Savior. Packer says this, on the cross, Jesus lost all the good that he had before, all sense of his Father's presence and love, all sense of physical, mental, and spiritual well-being, all enjoyment of God and of created things, all ease and solace of friendship were taken from him and in their place was nothing but loneliness, pain, a killing sense of human malice and callousness and a horror of great spiritual darkness. He knew this was coming all along, yet he continued he continued. Think about his moments in the garden. He asked his father for this cup to be taken. It says in Luke 22, it says, his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. The torture that he faced, the pain that he anticipated, but he submitted to God. He submitted to him. This was agony. This was agony. And he was not only facing death, but the heaviness of all of our sin was put on him. All of our filth, all of our shame, the depravity, the regrets, the selfishness, the darkness that dwells within us, all of our sins were put on him on that cross. And think about when you're in agony. Every minute is like an eternity. And he cried out when he was dying, Father, why have you forsaken me? 
This was agony, ladies. This was agony. The goodness that he had in the presence of the Father was taken from him for us. For us. He suffered so much for us to have goodness follow us all the days of our lives. And you know what? He didn't do it begrudgingly. He, our sin put him there. Our sin. And he was paying for sin that wasn't his. He was perfect. He had no sin. Yet he didn't do it while cursing us while thinking poorly of us, while hating us. No, instead, his goodness, his generosity, his love cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What a Savior we have. Like, what a Savior we have. He saw the joy set before him, that he did not despise the cross. He stayed focused on the goodness that didn't depend on circumstances because Jesus is good. He is good, and he is our good shepherd. He is our good shepherd. John 10, 11 says this, I am the good shepherd the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He is good. Psalm 23, that brings us to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Is he your shepherd? Are you following him? Because the good shepherd is the one we just described. He died for your sins, the most horrible death, so you wouldn't have to. Because God's goodness depends on his severity. Sin must be paid for. And he paid our price because he loves us. And he is good. He is good. The Lord is my shepherd. And what does a shepherd do anyways? He takes care of his sheep. We just watched that video. They know his voice. John 10, 12 through 15 says this. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep. The good shepherd knows his sheep. And if you are his, he knows you. And he will not leave you. Do you know him? Are you following him? Because if you are, look at this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Are you satisfied? Are you content in Jesus? Are you content in only Jesus? When your circumstances don't look good, do you still believe he's good? Do you still trust him when you can't control the situation? Are you satisfied in him and in him alone? Because ladies, he is the good shepherd and in him you lack nothing, you lack nothing. Only he can satisfy you. And listen to what it says he's going to do for you. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He is our rest. He guides us where we need to go. And if we're in his will, it doesn't matter our circumstances. He will renew us. He will be our strength. The commentary I, I read said this, the combination of green pastures and quiet waters portrays God's refreshing care for his own. He is caring for us, renewing us. And listen, where's he taking you? It says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. This isn't saying these paths here will lead one to be righteous. Rather, it's saying he will take us down the right path. He's leading us to be more like him. He is the one who is righteous. He is the one that's righteous. The righteous path is Jesus Christ. 
And he doesn't lead us there so we can look good to each other. He doesn't lead us there so we can be puffed up with all our spiritual gifts and our reputations. He's not concerned about what we look like to each other here in the church. No, he does it for him. He does it for him. It says for his name's sake. His name is Yahweh. It means I am. He is everything. And he sent his son, and Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. The good shepherd will be with us. The great I am will be with us. He will never forsake us. He keeps all of his promises to his covenantal children. He is loyal to his people, for his honor and reputation are at stake. He will not lie. He promised us, and he will do it. And it it will bring glory to his name. It'll bring glory to his name because it's all about him. It's all about him. And he will take us wherever we need to go to be more like Jesus. But he comes with us. He comes with us. Because verse four says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He takes his sheep down the right path and he will not take them, he will not unnecessarily wear them out. He will take them on the most direct route. Even if they have to go through some dark valleys because he is the good shepherd. He knows the way, he knows it. And his rod is not a punishing rod. His rod, that's a rod that fights off our enemy. It's a rod to fight off the wolves to protect us. And his staff, his staff, how beautiful that it gently leads us back. When we want to wander off on our own, he gently brings us back. Because he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And how powerful is he? Verse five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. There's no fear. He is in control. Our enemies can be at the table looking us in the eye and he prepares a table in in their presence because he is in control. He is all powerful. He sits with us in fellowship and we have nothing to fear, nothing to fear. And he doesn't just give us this bare minimum. No, it says, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. It overflows. The Lord is the host of the banquet. He is the host. And back then, the host would anoint the honored guest with oil mixed with perfumes. The psalmist here is expressing the honored position he's given at the table of the Lord. When the Lord, when he is our shepherd, he knows us. He welcomes us in. We are his honored guest. And our cup overflows when we have Jesus. It overflows. He is our portion. He is all we need, all we need. It doesn't matter what's going on. He is enough. He is enough. He is more than enough. Psalm 16.5 says, Lord, you alone are my portion in my cup. You make my lot secure. Psalm 73.26, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The overflowing cup shows us that the Lord is giving his children the best. He is giving them the best he can give, and it's enough. It's enough. It's our portion. It's more than enough. Listen, if we believe that Jesus is our good shepherd, if we follow him, he will restore us. He will give us rest. He will renew us. He is our strength. And he will lead us on the right path to make much of his name, to make much of his name. And all along the path, even though we go through some dark valleys, he's right there by our side. He's right there by our side, protecting us. No matter who's opposing us, he's there protecting us. He's providing our needs because he's chosen us as his people. We are his children. And if you believe this, then let me tell you, Psalm 23 says, surely goodness 
and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How can we not have goodness follow us when we have Jesus? How can goodness and mercy not follow us all the days of our lives when we are children of the living God and we are dwelling in his house forever? Because God is good. He is so good. And Jesus is the good shepherd. Will you follow him? Will you follow him no matter where he tells you to go? Will you trust him no matter what your circumstances look like? They may not look good, but will you follow him believing that he is good? Will you go wherever he tells you to go? Will you go wherever he tells you to lead for his name's sake, for his glory? Because surely goodness and mercy will follow us. Surely it will. Let's pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, you are so good. You are so, so good to us. Lord, you are our good shepherd. We are nothing without you, Lord, nothing. We need you, we need you, we need you. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you would help us. We want to follow after you every day of our life the good and the bad, Lord. We want to proclaim your goodness because you are good. It doesn't matter our circumstances. You are good. And Lord, I just pray. I pray for each woman here, Lord. I pray that they're following you. I pray that they know you as their personal Lord and Savior and that they follow hard after you every day of their life, Lord, that no matter where you call them to go, Lord, that they would be faithful, that they would go for your name's sake, for your glory. I pray for our church. Use us in this way. Use us in our neighborhood, in our community, that we could point people to you, to the good shepherd. I thank you, Lord, that we have hope that we are going to spend eternity and we are going to dwell in your house forever with you by our side. What more could we ask? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. You are beautiful. We adore you. We adore you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, us in all our our filth, in all our shame. You love us. And I just say thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ladies. Have a good night. Thank you, guys.